it's a perverse question, but what is an acceptable number of unarmed people that the police may accidentally shoot every year? This is the question that I'm going to explore, and I wrote an article about it, and I'm going to be reading the article to you for those people who prefer to listen to information rather than to read it. So what is an acceptable number of unarmed people that the police may accidentally shoot every year? Of course, many people will have a knee-jerk reaction and say, zero! Dude, of course it's zero. Now, if you answer that way, it's time to take a deep breath and relax. We're going to embark on a cold-hearted exercise that requires rationality, logic, and a heavy dose of realism. The implications are profound and important, so please bear with me. After listening to all this, you're welcome to tell me some constructive comment. Send me an email at ft at francistapon.com or make a comment on wanderlearn.com on this episode. Include what you think is a reasonable number of annual unarmed deaths by the police and why. I will update this article as I get thoughtful and intelligent feedback. A central argument in the Black Lives Matter movement is that cops, mainly white cops, are disproportionately killing black men, especially unarmed black men. It is Exhibit A on a long list of exhibits that prove systemic, structural, and institutional racism in America's police. This argument has been repeated so many times that it has become an axiom. Thus, questioning the Black Lives Matter thesis is tantamount to questioning whether our planet revolves around the sun. We will not question it. Instead, we will seek to quantify it. Metrics matter. Quantifying success and failure. Metrics allow us to objectively measure the size of a problem. Metrics also help us to measure our progress. Metrics also help us answer crucial questions, such as, when can we declare victory? When will we know that we've solved this crisis? In other words, when can we put down our signs, stop protesting, hug, give each other high fives, and scream, mission accomplished! Declaring victory ought to be based on facts and evidence, not on a group's feelings or one man's opinion. Therefore, we must set reasonable benchmarks. We must quantify where we want to be. What does a fair and just world look like, numbers-wise? Assuming that the current number of police killings of blacks is disproportionately high, then what number would be disproportionately low? And what number would be tragic but understandable? To understand what I mean, consider other tragic numbers. Every year, hundreds of babies die in daycare centers. Thousands die in traffic accidents. And millions die of preventable diseases. Since society is not vigorously protesting all these deaths, one could conclude that these deaths, while sad, are understandable. Our society deems that all those preventable deaths are tragic but tolerable. Therefore, the aim of this podcast is to help you calculate three numbers regarding the number of United States police killings of unarmed victims. The first number you should calculate is one that is a shockingly high number that is worth protesting about. The second is an expected number that we can begrudgingly live with and accept. And third is a remarkably low number that's almost worth celebrating. Great. Now let's analyze the data. United States police kill way more people per capita than any other rich nation. In the list of 62 random countries, the United States is ranked slightly below the median in the per capita police-caused casualties. This is embarrassing. High-income countries outperform the United States handedly. It's humiliating that the DRC beats the USA. Why isn't America in the top 10? Why isn't it clump 
next to the, its rich allies instead of several poor and dysfunctional nations. Doesn't this prove that the U.S. police are excessively violent? Before we jump to that conclusion, we must consider two critical facts. Number one, America's gun-filled environment. The U.S. is the only country in the world that has more firearms than people. Indeed, it has 20% more guns than people. We have twice as many guns per capita than the next country on the list, which is Yemen. War-torn Yemen, that's right. We have twice as many guns per capita. We have four times more guns per capita than the next two major countries on the list, Serbia and Montenegro. We have approximately 10 times more firearms per capita than Somalia, Russia, Chile, Albania, as well as the homicide-happy Guatemala and El Salvador. We have approximately 100 times more firearms per capita than the Democratic Republic of Congo, Guinea-Bissau, Mali, Palestine, Tunisia, and Chad. And finally, we have, get this, nearly 1,000 times more guns per capita than South Korea. Knowing that, imagine you're a police officer patrolling a country that is literally overflowing with firearms. Now ask yourself, if you're a cop, would you be more nervous and quicker to reach for your gun than a cop in the Netherlands? Do you think it's statistically probable that police killings in the United States would be comparable to South Korea, which has a thousand times fewer guns per capita? Would you expect and predict that if country A has a hundred times more firearms per capita than country B, that they would both have the same levels of police shootings? Would we be shocked that the U.S. police kill far more people per capita than Sweden, which has a very low gun per capita rate? All right, think about those questions. Next, the second key point is that the United States is unusually murderous for a high-income country. Not only does the United States have far more guns per capita than anyone else, but it's also a remarkably murderous country when compared to other high-income countries. When you examine the intentional per capita homicide rate of 230 countries and territories, the United States is just below the median, which lines up with where it falls in the police shootings rate. Meanwhile, the homicide rate of other high-income countries is also much lower than the United States. In other words, the United States' ranking on the global homicide scale is roughly the same as where our ranking is with police shootings, which is slightly below the median. Meanwhile, high-income countries have always better rankings on both metrics. And if you plot the two statistics together, you get this graph that looks, well, you got to see the graph, but basically <laughs> the United States is sitting out way out on a limb compared to any other OECD country, high-income country. Now, should we be surprised that our law enforcement officers end up killing criminals and suspects in their effort to stop the carnage, all these murders? And given all the firearms, should we be surprised that American cops are more likely to encounter an armed and dangerous suspect than a Japanese cop? There's a great video that I link to. There's a lot of videos I put to, but one of them is this crazy video where this woman, female cop, makes a traffic stop in the night and there's a Hispanic male and she comes up and asks him for his ID and that kind of stuff. And just in like less than a second, the guy pulls out a gun and starts shooting at the cop. And somehow she dodges the bullet. And somehow she goes around the back of the car, pulls out her handgun, and then fires about five, six bullets into him and kills him. It's a stunning video. And I watched it so many times and I just can't see how she could have seen him whip out that gun so fast. It happens in much less than a second. And how she somehow managed to not only dodge the bullet, but then managed to kill him. Crazy. But it just illustrates like sometimes how a cop should be on edge when they pull aside anybody because it's possible versus a Japanese cop 
<laughs> you pull aside somebody, you really don't have to worry about him whipping out a gun. It's just highly unlikely. All right, so after watching that video, you get a sense that an American cop must make life and death situ uh, life and death decisions in milliseconds. Do you think you could have done what this female cop did? I sure couldn't. Now imagine you're in a tense situation. Perhaps you're responding to a 911 call. You have a suspect a few meters away. It's night and hard to see. The suspect reaches behind his back. What do you do? Wait for him to shoot you? In theory, yes. Officers are trained not to fire on someone unless there's evidence that the cop's life is threatened. However, in the heat of the moment, humans may forget their training. Their instinctual desire for self-preservation may override their training. Now, have you ever been in an extremely fast-paced and stressful situation where you, in retrospect, made a lousy decision? If not, do you know anyone who has made a poor decision when under stress? Or at least, can you imagine that some people would, in a split second, make the wrong call? Some panicked people involuntarily freeze or faint, which is a terrible idea in a bad situation. We cannot always control ourselves. When my friend was assaulted by four men in South Africa, his fight-or-flight brain told him to fight. In retrospect, he says, it was an extremely stupid thing to do. He miraculously scared them away. A pair of Cameroonian thugs nearly strangled me to death because I wasn't giving them my wallet and phone. My instinctual reaction was to fight. While I was being strangled for 30 seconds, it was impossible for me to say, I can't breathe. I thought I might die, but my instincts told me to resist. I was foolish, and even though I won the battle, and kept my phone. It just was dumb to do this. By the way, my wallet, they did take it, but it only had $10. Now, let me ask you another question. Think about this. Which profession do you think kills more people accidentally? Cops or physicians? Although it's been declining over the decades, for the last five years, U.S. cops kill about 1,000 people per year. And by the way, not accidentally. Most of them, <laughs> they're on purpose. But let's just assume that's accidentally. According to a recent study by John Hopkins, and I provide the link, more than a quarter of a million people in the United States die every year because of medical mistakes, making it the third leading cause of death after heart disease and cancer. Think about that. And given that blacks are 13% of the population, that means that physicians kill 32,500 blacks every year. Now, since blacks are generally poorer than the average American, they disproportionately get physicians who are cheaper, less competent, and more error-prone than average. For the same reason, blacks probably also get inferior medical equipment and technology. Therefore, perhaps 26%, or double the rate, their proportion, of the quarter of a million physician-caused deaths are blacks. That would mean that 65,000 blacks die every year at the hands of a careless and sloppy physician. Those blacks entrusted their doctors to protect and save their lives in a similar way that we all trust our police to protect and save our lives. Society doesn't revolt when we hear that physicians kill 65,000 blacks every year. Indeed, Few even know that statistic. Nobody says that there's systemic racism among physicians. Nobody's burning down clinics. When a physician enters an operating room, it's unlikely that he is planning to kill his patient. It's also doubtful that when a cop pulls someone over, that he plans to kill him. And besides, it's a bad analogy because patients enter operating rooms naked, sedated, and unarmed. Police often deal with hostile, belligerent, and armed suspects. Metrics matter. We ought to celebrate if physicians only kill 50,000 people in a year, because that would be an amazingly good year on a relative scale since they consistently kill 250,000 without society flooding the streets. But physicians aren't trying to kill blacks, you scream. Those are mistakes, malpractice, accidents. When the police kill, it's murder. All right, 
Calm down. Calm down. Let's analyze this morbid topic. The psychopaths among us. Neil deGrasse Tyson told Coleman Hughes that it's possible to screen police applicants so well that we'll get rid of all the bad apples. Hughes disagreed. And here's why Hughes is unfortunately right. According to psychologists, 1% of the population is a psychopath. A psychopath isn't probably what you think he is. Although 25% of male inmates are psychopaths, psychopaths are rarely violent. You probably know a few psychopaths. There's a 1% chance that you are one. There are about 1 million physicians in the United States. If 1% are psychopaths, that suggests that there are about 10,000 physicians who are psychopaths. A few are diabolical. Here are just a few of the many doctors who were caught and convicted. There was Dr. Death, who was accused of killing and maining 33 patients and was condemned to life imprisonment. There was the Angel of Death doctor, who killed about 250 patients, mostly elderly women. Then there was Jayat Patel, who was an American surgeon who was convicted of three counts of manslaughter and one case of grievous bodily harm and sentenced to seven years imprisonment, but that was later overturned. Michael Swango was a physician who admitted killing four of his patients, but some believe that he killed as many as 60 patients. He is serving four consecutive life sentences. Dr. John Boken Adams had more than 160 of his patients die of suspicious causes, and 132 of those had put Dr. Adams in their wills before passing away. Like a police officer whose wrist gets slapped and continues working, Dr. Adams had his license stripped and then later reinstated. And although she's not a physician, this, just, this news just broke in July 2020, there was a nursing assistant who murdered seven military veterans. Now imagine if one cop had systematically killed as many people as just one of these murderous doctors. Boy, would you hear about it. Did we condemn all doctors when we learned about the callous way these evil doctors murdered people whom they were supposed to protect and serve? Of course not. Should we conclude that there's systemic racism in our healthcare system that is killing black bodies? Why aren't people torching hospitals and beating physicians? Nobody is chanting, abolish hospitals, defund medical care. We know it's wrong to condemn an entire profession because a few quote-unquote professionals were immoral or exercised horrible judgment. And why do we know that? It's because we've done a simple mental calculus. We know that in a large sample size, there is a statistical certainty that there will be some who will be crazy, cruel, incompetent, or immoral. The police universally condemned Derek Chauvin's killing of George Floyd, just as physicians universally condemned Dr. Death. In our polarized country that struggles to agree on anything, we ought to be grateful that we had a universal agreement that Floyd's death was tragic and wrong. If you're skeptical about psychopathic physicians, answer the following question. Can you imagine that among the one million U.S. physicians, that just one in a thousand of those physicians is an extreme racist? If so, that's 1,000 racist physicians who have opportunities to, quote-unquote, accidentally, wink, wink, kill blacks. Given that physicians kill 250,000 people each year, isn't it plausible that 1 in 10,000 of those deaths was not an accident? That's 250 murders every year. That's about one murder every day. And if we stick to our 26% number above, that means that diabolical, racist physicians murder 65 blacks per year, or about one per week. Now we can debate about the number of psychopaths or the number of white supremacists among the one million physicians, but we know it's not zero. 
There will always be bad apples among a large sample size. With 250,000 annual deaths, there's a high chance that some of those were murders that were covered up with malpractice insurance claims. Okay, now back to the cops. Police psychopaths. There are 800,000 police officers in the United States. Since 1% of our population is a psychopath, we can assume that there are 8,000 police officers who are psychopaths. In fact, it's probably higher than that. According to Dutton, the police is number seven on a list of careers with the highest numbers of psychopaths. Thus, we could have 20,000 psychopathic police officers on our streets. However, Let's be conservative and assume it's only 8,000. Although few psychopaths are violent, handing them a gun is probably unwise. CEOs are far more likely than police officers to be psychopaths, but they do not go to work with a pistol on their hip. American CEOs are the highest paid people around. They are heavily scrutinized by their board of directors, investors, and employees. Before they are hired, the board of directors will dig up as much dirt as they can about the CEO candidate. They will probe everything they can because they're about to pay that guy millions of dollars and entrust him with an enormous corporation. And yet, despite all that intense pre-hiring scrutiny and a battery of tests, 21% of CEOs are psychopaths. Okay, now imagine how the hiring process of a cop differs from that of a Fortune 500 CEO. Do you really think the government is going to delve that deeply into a potential cop's psyche? Do you think the police leadership will be better at catching psychopaths than an army of highly paid and trained people who are analyzing the next possible leader of Ford. But just to be stupidly optimistic, let's assume that we institute an insanely good screening process that is superior to the expensive and time-consuming CEO screening process. And as a result, we manage to weed out 90% of the psychos from the police force. Guess what? That still leaves us with 800 armed psychopaths patrolling the streets. Here's another problem. People change. Being a cop can be stressful and cause PTSD. You're surrounded by more negativity than the average person. You're constantly dealing with the worst of society. It can warp your world view. It can change you. It can make you callous. Think of the Stanford prison experiment. If you don't know about it, This professor took a bunch of Stanford students and made half of them guards and half of them prisoners and had to call off the experiment in just less than a week because the guards just started manhandling and terribly treating the prisoners. So if that happens in just less than a week, can you imagine what happens if you're working for years as a police officer, and all the stress that causes. Therefore, even if we only accept mentally stable people, some will degenerate while serving. Sure, we can do annual screenings in an attempt to catch such an ethical drift, but it's hard to fire a police veteran. After 50 years of service, how easy would it be to fire a police officer because he failed a psychological exam? And moreover, Wouldn't that veteran who passed multiple annual screenings know how to answer the psychological questions correctly and fool the government psychologists? Here's an even bigger problem. Even if you screen people perfectly, it's almost impossible to predict how people will behave in life and death situations when you have microseconds to react. Training helps. But even well-trained soldiers can freak out when the live bullets fly. An intense situation can temporarily hijack our ethics or clear thinking. A cop could go for many years or his whole career without ever drawing his gun. Suddenly, after eight years on the job, he must respond to an emergency situation in milliseconds for the first time in his life. Will the training he 
did years ago kick in automatically, or will he panic, shoot first, and ask questions later? Are cops infallible? You know, we all make mistakes. Coal miners accidentally kill their fellow miners due to negligence. Bus drivers accidentally skid school children off of a cliff. Planes crash due to human error. We accept that every year such tragic things will happen. And when I say that we accept such tragedies, I mean that we don't riot, assault innocent bystanders, and protest for weeks when such things happen. We do not abandon Uber, become atheists when priests sin, pummel bus drivers, or burn down hospitals. Instead, we punish the individual who made the inexcusable mistake. We accept that despite all our efforts to weed out the bad apples, Uber will accidentally hire a rapist or a murderer, and that a few doctors are murderous psychopaths. We accept that teachers and priests will be pedophiles. Some of them will. And that's because we know that we are all humans and therefore imperfect. We know that it is impossible for everybody in a large profession to be error free saints. What if none of the 800,000 cops were psychopaths or white supremacists? Let's just do that thought experiment. In an ideal imaginary world that you might live in, even if none of the 800,000 police officers are mentally unstable unstable or racist, you still have 800,000 cops who make mistakes. Obviously, most mistakes are not deadly. For instance, I have a video on that shows that a cop put a guy in jail because he thought he had found meth in his car. That meth actually was part of a glazed donut. I share a video where a cop accidentally tased another policeman. I mean, think about that. He's, <laughs> he's tasing your own fellow buddy. And that happens. There's mistakes. And there's Plenty of incidents where a cop accidentally shoots another cop with a pistol. There's a great story of these three black cops. I can't remember. I think it was in Atlanta. I'm not remembering the city. And they stormed into, by the way, the wrong home. (laughs) And it's like the Keystone cops. They stormed into this white couple's home. This is funny because, of course, you never hear this in the news. If they had stormed a black person's home and it was white cops doing it, you might have heard of it. Anyway, the black guy... One of the black cops shot another black cop. But that's just one story of among many. So should we be surprised that cops are also capable of making a far more serious error? That is, killing an unarmed person. If they're able to tase another policeman, shoot another policeman, don't you think it's possible that they might actually, by accident, shoot an unarmed person? There's a thing called slips and capture which talks about how sometimes in the spur of the moment we accidentally, you know, you want to slam on the brake, but instead you hit the accelerator or you, there's a cop that wanted to grab the taser, but instead grabbed the real gun and shot the guy and it eventually killed him. He was an old cop. It was like a 70 year old cop. And that's what happened. So that's called slips and capture, but it doesn't really matter whether you believe in that stuff or not. It's obvious that in the heat of the moment, mentally, Stable humans can still make grave errors. Let's talk about friendly fire. <laughs> you know, with friends like these, who needs who needs enemies? Now, humans with firearms accidentally kill people all the time. According to the CDC in the United States, there are about five hundred accidental firearm fatalities every year. Five hundred. And according to the International Hunter Education Association, in an average year, fewer than 1,000 people in the United States and Canada are accidentally shot by hunters. And of these, fewer than 75 are fatalities. Since the United States is about 10 times bigger than Canada and probably has 10 times more hunters, and of course Canadians have better aim, it's safe to assume that every year about 65 American hunters accidentally kill a fellow hunting buddy. Unlike police shooting accidents, hunting accidents are situations where there are no adversaries. You're out there with your buddies. 
Wildlife isn't armed with AR-15s. In the military, up to 23% of all battle deaths are friendly fire incidents. For example, during the 1991 Persian Gulf War, the United States Department of Defense reported that the United States forces suffered 148 battle-related deaths. 35 of them were from friendly fire. Nearly a quarter of all the deaths were from United States forces accidentally killing a fellow soldier. Think about that. Shooting a fellow soldier is like shooting your own brother. It's one of the worst tragedies of war. But friendly fire tragedies happen all the time. Why? Because we are human beings. We are imperfect. If enough people play with deadly toys, people will get hurt. It is a mathematical certainty. Moreover, in the heat of battle or any fast-paced emotional situation, humans are even more likely to make grave mistakes. And my favorite example is an officer, police officer, who accidentally shot another undercover police officer whom they had been working with for two years, get this, nine times. That's right, in the heat of the moment, The boss did not realize that he was shooting nine bullets into his fellow employee. Now, these guys aren't strangers. They knew each other. Not only had they worked together for two years, they had gone on 20 drug sting operations together. They probably ate many donuts together. And not only that, but they were at point-blank range in broad daylight so they could easily see each other. They're practically just (laughs) like a meter or two from each other. And yet, the boss still pumped his fellow employee, not with one bullet or two bullets, but nine bullets. Check out the disturbing video. You'll see the cop shoot Jacob nine times, and then the cop who shoots him says, Oh shit, that was Jacob! Are you okay? I'm sorry, man. I didn't know it was you. Come here, Jacob. Jacob's been shot. I thought you were the bad guy. He says all this while he's sobbing. Watch the video. It's on my website. Are you beginning to understand just how error-prone and dangerous policing is in the United States? If armed people accidentally shoot their best buddies either in hunting accidents, police accidents, firearm accidents, should we be surprised that our police might accidentally kill an unarmed criminal suspect? Fine, you say. All right, fine, fine. All right, I get that, Francis. But what about George Floyd's killer? That cop was calmly resting on George Floyd's neck. It's true that off Officer Derek Chauvin, the guy who killed George Floyd, wasn't faced with a life-and-death split-second decision. He had over eight minutes to contemplate what he was doing. Now, first of all, it's quite possible and maybe even likely that Officer Chauvin was one of the 8,000 psychopathic cops that we identified earlier. Psychopaths have impaired empathy and no remorse. They are callous. They are cold-hearted people. And such a description seems to fit Officer Chauvin. That would explain his actions. Case closed. On the other hand, it's also possible that he was not a psychopath. What the fuck, you say? Yep. I've been trying to imagine what Chauvin's lawyer will argue in court. He may argue that Officer Chauvin accidentally killed George Floyd. The defense will argue the following. With 2020 hindsight, we can all self-righteously claim that it was obvious that he was snuffing Floyd's life out. However, it's also obvious that Chauvin knew he was being filmed from multiple angles. It's also obvious that given his age, Chauvin knew about the Rodney King riots, the Ferguson riots, and the outrage that comes whenever white cops kill blacks. Did he really think 
that with all the cameras rolling, it was a marvelous time to lynch a black man. It's possible that Chauvin had done this restraining technique many times in his career. Other cops have. At the time of Floyd's death, the Minneapolis Police Department's Policy and Procedure Manual said that trained cops were allowed to use neck restraints and choke holes, so there was nothing unusual in that sense. It's possible that Chauvin was just as surprised that Floyd died as the cops who killed Tony Timpa were in almost the exact same fashion. There's a YouTube video that you should check out that also is on the same article where you'll see these bunch of cops who killed this white guy called Tony Timpa in almost the exact way. And in fact, one could even argue that the cops that killed Tony Timpa were even more callous than those who oversaw Floyd's deaths because Timpa's cops were joking around as Timpa was dying. However, few know about Timpa's tragedy, which happened a few years ago, because he was white. What's telling is the reaction of the cops when Timpa was stopped breathing. They became concerned and wondered if they had just accidentally killed him. It's possible that Chauvin was equally surprised that he killed Floyd. The officers who killed Timpa were acquitted. Timpa had cocaine in his system. Meanwhile, Floyd had fentanyl, methamphetamine, and cannabinoids in his system when he died. Perhaps that cocktail of drugs made Floyd have a heart attack, which is what the county medical examiner's controversial autopsy concluded. Listen, frankly, I don't know if Chauvin murdered Floyd on camera on purpose or by accident, and nor do I know if he was a psychopath or a racist. That's for the courts and the jury to decide. I'm not defending Chauvin. I'm simply imagining how Chauvin's defense team will explain Floyd's horrendous death. This is my point, is that somewhere along the line, someone made an unforgivable error. Either a police chief accidentally hired and for 20 years kept on the payroll a murderous psychopath, or Chauvin accidentally killed a man. And my other point is that, statistically speaking, such a barbaric event is guaranteed to happen. Now let's go into the numbers. Three billion annual police interactions. The Wall Street Journal estimated that there's 375 million annual contacts that police officers have with civilians, unquote. It's unclear how they calculated that 375 million annual contacts figure, but I think it could be an underestimation. I suspect contact means documented contact, where a cop logs an official incident. However, I've often asked cops questions on the street, and I doubt that they logged my encounter down. But it was an interaction with the public. Every single day, 800,000 cops are interacting with the public. Let's assume 10 interactions per day, traffic stops, chatting, responding to non-emergencies and emergencies. Well, add that all up, that's 8 million interactions per day. That's 3 billion interactions per year. If there's a one in a million chance of something going terribly wrong, then that means 3,000 things a year will go terribly wrong. That's eight times per day. If we accept the Wall Street Journal's 375 million figure, then that means a one in a million tragedy would happen about every single day. You can adjust the numbers, but the point is clear. In any given year, many tragic, heartbreaking events will happen. To expect Perfection is utterly unrealistic. Six Sigma Robo Cops. In business school, I learned about how Motorola and other major companies implemented Six Sigma operations. That means that 99.99966% of all opportunities should be defect free. In other words, they aimed for defect levels below 3.4 defects per million opportunities. This is an extraordinarily high standard. Companies usually implement Six Sigma operations that involve computers and robots, not humans, since a human is often going to make more than 3.4 errors per million tries. However, given our intolerance for police mistakes, it seems that we expect all our cops should be robo-cops. 
And yet even RoboCop would make 3.4 errors per million tries. With 3 billion interactions, that means our RoboCops would make 10,200 errors per year. Once you begin to consider the number of firearms that the United States has, the unusually high murder rate, the 20,000 psychopaths in our police, and the statistical possibility that armed humans will make grave mistakes in high-pressure situation, then what's remarkable isn't that cops kill 1,000 people per year, but that they only kill 1,000 people per year. More importantly, 96.7% of the 1,000 people that the police kill are armed and dangerous. As Heather McDonald wrote, quote, But in light of the number of arrests that police officers make every year, around 11 million, and the number of deadly weapons act attacks on officers, 27 a day in just two-thirds of the nation's police departments, it is not clear that 1,000 civilian deaths, the vast majority occurring in the face of potentially deadly attack, show a law enforcement profession that is out of control, unquote. None of this is meant to suggest that the police don't unjustly harass and target blacks, without a doubt, it's hard to be black in America, especially if you're black and poor. Blacks deal with daily frustrations and injustices that are exhausting and humiliating. I wish I could wave a wand and make all blacks be a cop for one year and cops be black for one year. At the end of that year, both blacks and cops would say, get it now. I totally get it. Oh, man. God, that's right. The often unmentioned data that changes everything. A Washington Post opinion piece wrote, A study of police shooting databases published by the National Academy of Sciences found that African American men were about 2.5 times more likely than white men to be killed by police. The Post's own comprehensive examination of police shootings showed that black Americans account for just 13% of the population, but one-fourth of the police shootings. Among unarmed victims, the disparity was even greater. More than one-third of those fatally shot were black. Unquote. Does reading such statistics make your blood boil? We've all read similar statistics that show how blacks are disproportionately imprisoned and killed by the police. Now, let's see how your blood boils when I read you these statistics. 93% of prison inmates are men. 96% of those that the police kill are men. 99.6% of those state prisoners convicted of rape are men. And men get 71% of the traffic citations. You're not outraged, right? Why not? Because you intuitively know the other side of the equation. Compared to women, testosterone-driven men are far more likely to drive recklessly, murder, rape, and commit violent crimes. You don't know the exact numbers, but you don't jump to the conclusion that there's systemic sexism in the police and justice system because the numbers are skewed against men. The same logic ought to apply when we evaluate police shootings. We must consider the black crime rate before we jump to the conclusion that lynch squads are targeting blacks. Blacks, who are 13% of the population, commit about half the homicides, violent crimes, and burglaries, are seven times more likely than whites to commit homicide. And according to the FBI Uniform Crime Reports, black youths who make up 16% of the youth population accounted for 52% of the juvenile violent crime arrests, including 58.5% of the youth arrests for homicide and 67% for robbery. When faced with such facts, activists may answer, those stats are misleading because Racist police and bigoted judges conspire to falsely accuse and convict blacks. You know, that certainly happens. But does it explain everything? 
as we saw with men and women, whenever you categorize people, we're never perfectly proportional. For example, 91% of nurses are female. Is that evidence of discrimination or sexism? 75% of NBA players are black. Is that evidence of racism against whites? Asians are 5.6% of the United States population, but only 1.5% of prisoners are Asian. Is that evidence of a sinister Asian supremacy? If our goal is that our prisons should match our U.S. demographics perfectly, we will always fail miserably. To succeed, we'll need to round up more senior citizens, more women, Jews, Asians, doctors, lawyers, nuns, professors, and so on until we get a prison system that matches America's demographics. And the same applies to shootings. We have to accept that some groups will always outperform or underperform other groups. To expect perfect equality of outcome and performance is unrealistic and naive. Even communists couldn't achieve that goal. So racism explains a lot, but it does not explain everything. Now that we've considered many facts, let's get back to the question that started this long podcast. How many unarmed deaths should the police be allowed to commit before our society says, ho, 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 wait a second, that's an unreasonably high number. A similar question is, how many unarmed victims is a quote-unquote good number that shows that the cops are exceeding reasonable expectations? And finally, what is an acceptable number of unarmed deaths that we can kind of live with? Whether we're aware of it or not, our society calculates what's a reasonable number of tragedies we're willing to put up with in every profession. If that profession dramatically exceeds that number, then we need reforms or perhaps a revolution. And that's what happened in the airline industry. When I was a kid, society deemed that thousands of airline deaths were unacceptable and that we could do better. And over the decades, we got deaths down to a couple hundred a year. We will probably never get it to zero, but we can celebrate our progress with regards to airline deaths, having diminished from the thousands into the hundreds per year. Have you come up with your three numbers, the remarkably low number, the acceptable number, and the protest-worthy number of unarmed deaths that police ought to be able to do without, you know, causing scandal, and what is scandal-worthy? After you've thought about it, now consider this, that every day, 40 people shoot police officers. So that's 14,600 armed encounters per year. 14,000. Now, knowing that, is 1,000 police cause fatalities a shockingly high number? Think about that. 14,600 armed encounters. I would think that maybe half of them would end up with somebody dying, that the police shooting somebody. But it's not half. That would be 7,000 or so. It's 1,000 only. So somehow police are able to de-escalate the 14,000 armed encounters down to only 1,000 deaths. To me, that's like, hmm, you know, that would, that's lower than I would have predicted at least. I would think that like half the time they would end up with somebody getting shot by the police. And get this, of the 1,000 police killings, only 3.3% of them were unarmed. In other words, nearly twice as many United States hunters accidentally shoot their hunting buddies as the United States police accidentally shoot unarmed suspects. Remember that wildlife hunters are not confronting hostile and belligerent foes. Next question, how many blacks do the police kill every year? Now, among the 1,000 police killings, let's see how the Wall Street Journal summarizes the Washington Post data. 
Quote, In 2019, police officers fatally shot 1,004 people, most of whom were armed and otherwise dangerous. African Americans were about a quarter of those killed by cops last year, and a ratio that has remained stable since 2015 when the record keeping began. That share of black victims is less than what the black crime rate would predict since black shooting victims are a function of how often police encounter armed and violent suspects. In 2018, the last year that such data has been published, African Americans made up 53% of known homicide offenders in the United States and commit about 60% of the robberies, even though they are 13% of the population. Unquote. In other words, you might expect that the group that commits half the homicides would represent about half the police killings, right? But they only represent a quarter. Does that make you wonder whether that's evidence that maybe the police are not trying to systematically target black people if they're actually underrepresented compared to their homicide rate? Okay, now the next question. How many unarmed blacks do the police kill? First of all, let's define unarmed. The Washington Post, which tracks nationwide police killings better than the federal government, defines unarmed rather loosely. The Washington Post considers the following suspects, quote-unquote, unarmed. There was a suspect in New Jersey who had a loaded handgun in his car during a police chase. He's unarmed. Suspects who grabbed an officer's gun are considered unarmed. A suspect who fled from a car stop with a loaded semi-automatic pistol in their vehicle, unarmed. So that's how they define unarmed. Now, originally, the Washington Post reported that in 2019, the United States police killed only nine unarmed blacks. And now realizing that some would find that number rather underwhelming, the Post scrambled to boost the numbers retroactively. Quote, After the tally of nine unarmed victims was reported in certain news outlets last week, the Washington Post reclassified over a dozen of its armed victims of police shootings as unarmed. This reclassification occurred six months after the Post had already closed its 2019 database. The reclassification was not done on the basis of any new information. It was undoubtedly done to get the black victim numbers up. The Post is now showing 15 unarmed black victims in 2019. Now, to put those 15 tragic unarmed black fatalities in 2019 in perspective, they represent 3% of the 500 accidental firearm fatalities per year. They represent, get this, 0.2% of all black homicide victims. And they also represent a 60% reduction of the unarmed black victims in 2015, when the police had killed 38 unarmed blacks. By the way, I really dislike Trump. I don't want to see him reelected. I didn't vote for him the first time around. And so I'm not trying to make a political point here. But 2015, that was under Obama. 38 unarmed blacks killed. Under Mr. Terrible Trump, it reduced down to 60, 60% down. So from 38 unarmed blacks under Obama killed in a year, 2015, down to only 15 in 2019 under Trump. Now, I'm not blaming Obama. I'm not giving credit to Trump because I don't think the United States president has that much control or say about how many blacks, unarmed blacks are killed. That's a very local issue. And I don't think the arm of the president reaches that deeply into the nation and controls the the action that's going on on the street. Even if they wanted to, it's hard to control that. But it is just a point worth making people who think that things are gotten worse. No, they've actually gotten better. 60% in reduction is quite a remarkable decline. Now, by the way, I think that 2020 will probably go up because of all the violence that has been going on in 2020 compared to 2019. 
Okay, here's another noteworthy statistic. A 2015 Justice Department analysis of the Philadelphia Police Department found that, I'm quoting by the way, white officers were less likely than black or Hispanic officers to shoot unarmed black suspects, unquote. Admittedly, this is just one, albeit a big, police department in the United States. We need more data. But let's not ignore the little data that we have. It's fascinating that the Justice Department, impartial, looks at it and says, huh, white officers are less likely than black or Hispanic to shoot an unarmed black suspect. And here's one other thing. A black Harvard economist called Roland Fryer carefully researched the 1,000 police killings, and he admitted that he was surprised to discover that there was zero evidence of racial bias in police shootings. I linked to his report. Neil deGrasse Tyson told Coleman Hughes that a recent study showed that the chance of a, quote, unarmed person killed by the police or dying in police custody is about the same regardless of your ethnic group. And Coleman Hughes agreed, who's also black, by the way. So let's review the key points. There's about 15 key points. I'll rattle them off. The United States is by far the most heavily armed nation. Two, we're extremely murderous for a high-income country. Three, there are 800,000 cops, of which 20,000 are psychopaths. Four, even if we reduce the psychopaths by 90%, we still have 2,000 psychopathic cops. Five, there are between 375 million to 3 billion police interactions every year. Six, the police face 14,600 armed encounters per year. Seven, of the 1,000 people that the police kill, 96.7% are armed and dangerous. Eight, only 3.3% of police killings are unarmed, and most of the victims are white. Nine, 45 million blacks cause 50% of the homicides and robberies. Ten, about 25% of the victims of police shootings are blacks, which is disproportionately lower than their proportion of, of the homicide rate. 11. Unarmed blacks killed by police represent 0.2% of all black homicide victims. 12. In 2019, 800,000 police accidentally killed 15 unarmed blacks, while 1 million physicians accidentally killed about 65,000 unarmed blacks. Everyone makes mistakes, and those mistakes can be deadly when you're playing with firearms in high-pressure situation. And my last two facts, everyone is now walking with a video camera and a social media account which amplifies every tragedy. And the last point, a one-in-a-million tragedy could happen every day. Now, given all these numbers, one can imagine that the police could shoot an unarmed person every day. However, in 2019, it only happened 44 times. With all the abolish the police rhetoric nowadays, it seems absurd to applaud the police for their restraint. But given the facts above, it is unfair and inaccurate to depict cops as a bunch of bloodthirsty murderers. We need benchmarks. Based on the facts above, here's what I think are reasonable benchmarks, and you tell me what you think. Remember I talked about those three numbers. Well, I would say too many deaths would be over 1,500 police killings overall and or 100 unarmed deaths. An expected number of deaths, something that's kind of tolerable that we can live with, would be 750 to 1,500 police shootings overall, and about 20 to 100 unarmed deaths. To me, that's kind of like we're in normal zone there. And a remarkably low number of deaths, one that we could almost applaud, is if the police shot fewer than 750 victims and fewer than 20 unarmed victims overall. 
we must also have a benchmark for the percentage of those police killings who are black. For example, if 10% of the airline passengers are black, then we should expect that about 5 to 15% of airline fatalities would be black. Any number that deviated much more than that would spark an investigation. With police killings, we could use the homicide rate as a proxy for violent crime. Therefore, if blacks cause 50% of the homicides, then it should not surprise us if 40 to 60% of the police killings are blacks. Currently, it's about 25%, so we're below the expected percentage, which is good news for blacks, but bad news for whites. I'm not saying that my proposed benchmarks are right. I'm simply encouraging everyone, especially the leaders of the Black Lives Movement, to think reasonably and logically about this issue and come up with realistic benchmarks. We effectively do this with every profession. We, quote-unquote, accept deaths in every profession. And the police should be no exception. Benchmarks would change if our firearm ownership and homicide rates were to dramatically fall or rise. For instance, if blacks commit only 10% of the murders, then we should expect that they would be 5 to 15% of those killed by the police. Or if our gun ownership and murder rates collapse to match Germany's rates, then we would expect our per capita police killings to be plus or minus 20% of Germany's rate. We're setting ourselves up for failure. I didn't want to write this article. I didn't want to do this podcast. I know it will ignite a firestorm of controversy and anger. However, if we ignore statistics and logic, we're doomed to always fail because given our level of gun ownership and murders, our expectations of police shootings are unreasonable. Get this through your head. Unless 80% of our firearms vanish and our homicide rate, especially our black homicide rate, drops by 80%, unless that happens, then there's no hope of getting the 15 police shootings of unarmed black men down to zero. In 2015, it was nearly three times that number and we could easily revisit those levels in the 2020s. If you want our per capita police shootings to match other high-income countries, then we must copy key aspects of other high-income countries, dramatically reduce our firearm, and lower our homicide rate so that it equals their levels. If we're unwilling or incapable of doing that, then we must recalibrate our expectations. We must learn to live with the police killing 20 to 100 unarmed people every year and about 1,000 armed people every year. Every year we live with hundreds of passengers dying in plane accidents, thousands dying in car accidents, and 250,000 dying at the hands of an incompetent physician. Focusing on other techniques such as de-escalation, defunding, no chokehold, no knee on the neck. Those are all band-aids. They will hardly move the needle, especially since 96.7% of police killings are of armed suspects. With a Herculean effort, perhaps we can cut police killings in half, but we'll still have traumatic numbers unless we adjust our expectations. Cutting the statistics in half means that 500 police killings every year. That's still 22 unarmed killings per year. That's still one unarmed black killed every other month. That means that just as one protest dies down, another protest will pop up. We'll be outraged all year long, forever. Either we change our gun ownership and homicides level, homicide levels, or we change our expectations. Given our passion for the Second Amendment, it is unlikely that our firearms 
will decrease. Calls to defund or abolish the police have only spurred more gun sales. We've added 3 million guns to our country since the spring of 2020. That 3 million gun increase since spring of 2020, that happened because of COVID, but most of all because of the protests and all these people saying defund and abolish the police. So people said, okay, fine, if that's going to happen, I'm going to run out and get myself a gun. And that's what happened. So all of a sudden, we got three more, three million more guns in the United States. Given that nowadays everyone walks around with a video camera, that means that about once a month, you're going to get footage of a policeman killing an unarmed black. And if you don't see the footage, the media will proclaim the tragic story. During the Jim Crow days, the media would amplify any story where a black man hurt a white person. The media ignored stories of blacks who coexisted peacefully with whites. The Jim Crow media also ignored stories of whites lynching, hurting, or discriminating against blacks. It was just one story all the time. Blacks are a menace to whites. This demonized blacks. Now we're making the same mistake. We're amplifying police shootings of unarmed blacks while ignoring other relevant facts. Have you ever heard of Brandon Stanley, Daniel Schraver, James Scott, Derek Cruz, Dylan Noble? Does any of these names ring a bell to you? I doubt it. But those are some of the names of, of the many unarmed whites that the police killed. Now, let me ask you a different question. Have you heard of Trayvon Martin, George Floyd, Tamir Rice, Michael Brown, Breonna Taylor? Of course you have. So all this proves that the Black Lives Matter movement has succeeded in shining the spotlight on black lives. Two-thirds of Americans support Black Lives Matter. A lot of people say to me, but don't you want to be on the right side of history? One of my friends has repeatedly told me, Francis, you're on the wrong side of history. If carefully analyzing statistics and using logic puts me on the wrong side of history, then crucify me. If being on the right side of history involves brushing important facts under the carpet in the name of social justice, then I'm uninterested in being on the quote-unquote right side of history. If we manage to reduce police killings by 80% without a corresponding firearm and homicide reduction, then I will be on the wrong side of history. I believe that the United States will ultimately come to terms with the reality I've presented. Society will have to adjust its expectations once we realize that an infallible police is an impossibility, especially in a country that is overflowing with weapons and murders. But you're tone deaf. A few people hurl the 21st century insult of being tone deaf at me. This suggests that I'm being callous, insensitive, and unempathetic to the plight of blacks. On the contrary, each time a white police officer kills an unarmed black, our nation, and even the world, suffers intense trauma. Like any sensitive person, I want that trauma to stop. Moreover, I don't want the police to shoot my black wife. So I have an incentive here. However, what if, after running the numbers, it becomes obvious that it's extremely unlikely for the trauma to stop by simply defunding, abolishing, or retraining the police. Should you ignore those numbers and keep protesting? What if every time a plane crashes, the world ignites in a firestorm of protests, burns airports, and attacks the TSA employees? In that case, I would say, oh, wait a second, folks. Expecting zero airplane fatalities when we have five billion airline passengers annually is unrealistic. Given all the moving parts and all the humans involved, a couple of a hundred airline-related fatalities is remarkably low. Those who have lost loved ones in an airplane crash would accuse me of being tone-deaf, and I would accuse them of being blind to the statistical reality. 
we're suffering from groupthink. Groups are usually right. I love talking about the wisdom of the crowds. On the other hand, sometimes the crowd gets it wrong. Sometimes we succumb to groupthink. In the 1950s, groupthink said that interracial marriages were wrong. Only 4% approved of them. I'm sure independent thinkers were bullied by the majority for their contrarian thinking. Of course, contrarians are often wrong. I don't believe in being a contrarian just for the sake of getting a rise out of people. On the contrary, being a contrarian is exhausting. I'm not suggesting that I'm right. I could be wrong. In fact, I'm often wrong. So if you think I'm wrong, I welcome your intelligent criticism. Just be aware that I am not swayed by tragic stories or sincere feelings. I demand evidence, logic, statistics, careful analysis. Call me a cold, heartless asshole, but I prefer being realistic and fair, even if the answer is counterintuitive and politically incorrect. If you base your beliefs on emotions, stories, and anecdotes, then you will find this podcast incomprehensible and offensive. I wrote this article and recorded this podcast a couple of months after George Floyd died. I wrote it because I'll need to share this article and this podcast throughout the 2020s because it is a statistical certainty that there will be more George Floyds, more Trayvon Martins, more Ahmaud Arbery's, just like I know there will be more airline accidents, more malpractice deaths, and more daycare deaths. Sadly, I'll have to keep sharing this article until we either adjust our expectations or we adjust our gun ownership and murder rates. People are horrible at math. We're emotional creatures. We are more easily swayed by rousing stories than dry numbers. We exhibit an awful understanding of statistics when we get nervous about boarding an airplane, but calm when we enter a car. After September 11th, we became hysterically concerned about terrorism. Thanks to groupthink, we spent trillions of dollars and killed hundreds of thousands of people half a world away because 3,000 Americans tragically died. Even 15 years after 9-11, terrorism was America's second greatest fear, which was completely delusional. From 2008 to 2015, the annual chance of dying in a terrorist attack on U.S. soil was 1 in 30 million. Now groupthink is twisting reality again. In 2019, we amplified the 15 unarmed blacks that the police killed while ignoring the 29 unarmed whites who were killed. As a result, we've managed to traumatize blacks so badly that they're more likely to resist the police because we've convinced them that they will get lynched. Resistance escalates a benign situation and increases the risk of another heartbreaking story to hit the news. Even megastars like LeBron James, who live in mansions with tight security, are caught up with a mass hysteria. He talks about, he tweeted about being afraid to walk outside because he might get shot or killed. The reality is that an unarmed black in the United States has a one in three million chance of being killed by the police. That means a black is twice as likely to be killed by a wild animal in any given year. So how can we reduce black deaths? If someone ordered you to dramatically reduce the number of black killings, would you focus most of your effort on police killings? No, that's not where the low-hanging fruit lies. Every year, about 7,500 blacks are murdered. Therefore, even if we miraculously eliminated all unarmed police shootings, 99.8% of black homicide victims would remain. It's depressing that blacks die of homicide at eight times the rate of whites and Hispanics combined. Black Lives Matter focuses on police killings, blacks, but if they want any hope of lowering that number, they will need to focus on the elephant in the room, blacks killing. 
blacks. 90% of the blacks who are killed are killed by other blacks. According to comments submitted to the Committee on the Judiciary of the United States House of Representatives in response to the oversight hearing of policing practices and law enforcement accountability, quote, Blacks between the ages of 10 and 43 die of homicide at 13 times the rate of whites, according to the CDC. In New York City, blacks make up 73% of all shooting victims, even though they are 23% of the city's population. In Chicago in 2016, there was 4,300 shooting victims, and almost all of them were black. So you might be wondering, am I trying to say that systemic racism is a myth? No, that's not what I'm saying. Roland Fryer, the guy we mentioned earlier, revealed that police were 50% more likely to rough up blacks and Hispanics compared to whites. And here are a few more points from the Washington Post that show evidence of systemic racism. And I link to all these things. There's a study of nearly 100 million traffic stops by police departments nationwide found that black drivers were more likely to be pulled over than white drivers. African Americans are far more likely to be arrested for petty crimes. A 2018 study exposed, quote, profound racial disparity in the misdemeanor arrest rate for most, but not all, offense types, unquote. The black arrest rate was at least twice as high as that for whites for disorderly conduct, drug possession, simple assault, theft, vagrancy, and vandalism. A 2020 study of marijuana possession arrests by the American Civil Liberties Union concluded that even in an era of legalization and decriminalization, there were, quote, stark racial disparities, unquote, in possession arrests, with a black person more than three and a half times more likely to be arrested for possession than a white person, even though rates of usage are similar. The disparities exist, quote, across the country, in every state, in counties large and small, urban and rural, wealthy and poor, and with large and small black populations, unquote. There is evidence that blacks are historically prosecuted more harshly for the same crimes as whites. There is evidence that sentencing for killing blacks is usually less harsh than it is for killing whites. There is evidence of redlining and various other types of discrimination. I also link to an exhaustive list, exhaustive list showing evidence of police bias. At the bottom of that list, you'll see some contrarian cases that show no bias. But the list indicating bias is much longer than the list that shows no bias. Therefore, there's ample evidence that indicates that the police have plenty of room for improvement. But shooting unarmed blacks should not be Exhibit A in one's effort to prove systemic racism. I have focused on police shootings because that's what the Black Lives Matter and the protesters focus on. The data tells us to focus elsewhere. So finally, I'll leave you with six solutions that I've come up with because I hate just complaining and I just like talking about solutions. You can tell me if you have better solutions or what you think of mine. We must not waste money and attention. Black Lives Matter is a remarkably powerful movement. Unfortunately, it's directing much of its power, attention, and money at the issue of unarmed blacks killed by the police. Although it's symbolically important, there are many issues that are more impactful. If we want to dramatically improve black lives, we ought to pursue these six causes. Number one, legalize all drugs, including heroin, and free everyone who is in prison on drug-related crimes. Nearly half the inmates are there for drug-related crime. With legalization, we could, overnight, drain our prisons and reunite drug offenders who are disproportionately black with their families. That brings up issue number two. Encourage a two-parent household. I'm not sure how to do this, but I do know that fatherless boys too often get into trouble, both academically and legally. Number three, 
stop black on black crime. This is the elephant in the room. The group that kills the most blacks are the blacks themselves. Gun buyback programs may help. Flooding black communities with black cops could decrease black on black crime. Follow the advice that black community leaders have for reducing crime in their neighborhoods. Number four, free education up to any degree level. Now there's resistance to paying reparations. There's also resistance to offering free college education to all Americans. I'm skeptical too, but why not try to do a 10-year pilot project with black Americans and see how it goes? If a black person wants to get a STEM degree, as like science or technology, engineering, medical, or get a JD or an MBA or a PhD, then let's see what happens if taxpayers foot the bill. If the results are good, then we can roll the program out to more disadvantaged groups. Solution number five, require police wear body camps because they're useful for a number of reasons. And number six, final solution, reduce firearms. Now, obviously, this is extremely unlikely, but it's worth a shot, so to speak. It's not a panacea. Just because we drop gun ownership in half doesn't mean that homicides will drop in half. There are many ways to kill a human. Still, if we want our homicide rate to approach the homicide rate of other high-income countries, then we must adopt some of their habits. These solutions would improve black lives and minimize the number of police killings. Clearly, there are many other solutions we ought to consider. We must think of solutions that will change 45 million black lives, not just 15. And by improving their lives, we all benefit. I welcome your comments. I put some links there to an interesting article and essays by Coleman Hughes and Sam Harris podcast about this issue. And if you think it's important to change our group think, please share this article. And if you have any comments, you can send me a comment at ft at com. And in your comment, please write what you think is an acceptable number of unarmed people that the police may accidentally shoot every year and explain why you think it's a reasonable number. And if you believe that number is zero, then please explain why you think that's possible given the current environment and how you propose we make that happen. I hope this has been helpful, enlightening, thought-provoking, useful in some way or another. Please share it. We need to change our expectations or change our behavior one way or another. Otherwise, we're going to be forever traumatized. I want the best for our nation and for the world. And I think we all do. The question is, how do we get there? This is France Tapon, encouraging you to wander and learn. And that concludes this episode of the Wander Learn podcast, where we explore travel, technology, and transformation. If you'd like to see the show notes with links to what we talked about, or if you'd like to comment on the show, or if you'd like to ask me a question, then go to wanderlearn.com and click on this episode. If you'd like to connect with me, just remember FTAPON. That's my first initial and my last name. FTAPON is the username I use on all social media. You can also get to my website by going to ftapon.com. And here's one last reason to remember FTAPON. If you like what I do and would like to get rewarded for supporting my projects, then go to patreon.com slash FTAPON. That's where you can pick up some remarkable rewards for as little as $2 a month. And now for five quick favors. Number one, subscribe to the Wander Learn podcast. Two, download it. Three, share it. Four, review it somewhere. And five, sign up for my newsletter at wanderlearn.com. Our theme music was composed by Eric Stratman. This is Francis Tapon, encouraging you to wander and learn. <laughs>